So God's grace and his mercy are yours in Christ Jesus our Lord. Psalm 38 is a bit of a tough one. It's one of the darker psalms that we read in the Bible. It's kind of, for some people, a little depressing at the beginning, but it's also very honest. One of the awesome things about Lent is we're honest about who we are in front of a holy and righteous God, but it's also honest about who Jesus is and how he takes this upon himself. And this psalm very, very clearly not only is honest about us, but points to how Christ takes that upon himself. In fact, it reminds us of the cost of the fall. Um, When God says in Genesis, I'm going to multiply your sorrow, or he says the ground is going to be cursed for your sake, we see that result in Psalm 38. And it it infects the whole person. In fact, it's like Psalm 6, the psalm that I uh, spoke to you about a couple of weeks ago, and that the whole body seems to be affected. It's not just a feeling. It's not just something that you have in the back of your mind. The entire being of this person is suffering, in this case, David, from his sins. So look at how the whole body is affected. If you're following the text, I have the ESV in front of me, so it's a little different than what is printed for you. So I'll try to point out what verse I'm in on this. But notice that immediately, the arrows of God, it says, the arrows have sunk into me. Now, of course, these aren't literal arrows. There was a translation I read that said these could be translated thunderbolts, interestingly enough, that God's getting your attention is the idea here. Your arrows have sunk into me, and your hand has come down. And then it talks about his flesh. There's no soundness in my flesh or health in my bones. And then later on as it goes, it talks about his wounds stinking and festering. The image that came to my mind when I read this was actually the parable of the Good Samaritan. The guy who's laying down, beat up in the road, stinking, left for dead. It sounds like this, in a way, if you really think about it, because... We are like that person beat up on the road and Jesus becomes that good Samaritan for us. I'm sure you've heard Pastor Dinger say similar things to you in the past. But think about that image of that broken, wounded, stinking man. And that's what we get when it's talking about our sin. But it's not just the physical part. The heart is mentioned here. The ESV in verse 8 says the tumult of the heart, which is kind of an interesting way, meaning the heart is like spinning around. It's unsettled. You can't focus on anything. Any of you had nights like that before? where you can't go to sleep because your heart is just spinning in place and you can't get stuff off your mind. I personally have experienced moments like that spiritually. So I'm just being honest in my own spiritual walk, my own spiritual life, where I could not sleep until I got up and confessed my sins. Because God was working on me, sending his Holy Spirit. I knew that I had wronged and I searched my life and I was sweating a little bit uh, in the middle of the night and I woke up and I spent some time at like two in the morning because I was very fully aware of how I had erred. But then there was also mercy and grace that came as a response for it. So you can relate to that, the idea of you're just not being able to focus because of that. It's, it continues with other things, too. His longing, it's his, utter, his inner being, what he wants for. He is crushed and feeble. It's not a pretty picture. I mean, we really truly are that beaten up victim. And so what is the response to it? Like, how do we respond to our condition in that way, that honesty about how every one of us is before the Almighty God? The answer in this psalm is confession and repentance. That's what it is. We confess, and God saves us. Notice also that the psalmist doesn't say, I'm going to like check all these boxes, and then God's going to love me again. He has no hope in that way. It's, okay, God, I'm going to go uh, do this sacrifice, and I'm going to go give this thing to my neighbor, and I'm going to read my Bible more, and I'm going to go to the temple three times this week, and then God's going to love me. That's, that's not how this works. He has no other hope except to say that God is my salvation. Make haste to help me. That's how the psalm ends. O Lord of my salvation. His hope is in God alone, and there simply is no other solution. I'm going to give you a quote. This comes from a guy named Oswald Chambers. He wrote in the late 1800s, early 1900s, very famous in evangelical circles. Now, he's not a Lutheran, so we would tweak a word here or there, just so you know. We would talk about how the Holy Spirit creates the faith that he talks about, or we might mention the sacraments or something like that, word and sacrament. But the sentiment of what he says here is absolutely correct in that God does it first. And I want you to hear this because sometimes even when we talk about good things like repentance, it sounds like we're doing it, but he gets it right. You'll hear what he means by it. I want you to listen to this quote. I'll try to read it as, uh, against my own nature and read it slowly, okay? All right. It is not repentance that saves me. Repentance is the sign that I realize what God has done in Christ Jesus. The danger is to put the emphasis on the effect instead of the cause, We all have that thing. Well, I repented. I got saved. I did this thing. 
No, you realize what God's already done for you. That's where he's getting this right here. It is, is it because of my obedience that puts me right with God? Never. I am put right with God because prior to all else, Christ died. When I turn to God and by belief accept what God reveals, which we would say is also a gift itself, instantly the stupendous atonement of Jesus Christ rushes me into a right relationship with God. By the miracle of God's grace, I stand justified, not because of anything I have done, but because what of Jesus has done. The salvation of God does not stand on human logic. It stands on the sacrificial death of Jesus. Sinful men and women can be changed into new creatures by the marvelous work of God in Christ Jesus, and this is an important phrase, which is prior to all experience. Prior to any of us even being born, Christ died for us. And so we can't earn that if that's already taken place. And if, and, and if you want my little uh, theological thought to make your brain hurt of the day, since God is outside of time, think about that for a little bit, right? God's outside of time, and if he did it prior to us, that means he did it prior to really any sort of sense of time, which is enough to make your brain hurt, okay? So just think about that for a little bit if you want a higher thought for the day. But again, notice how this psalm points ultimately to Christ. And Christ in this, I want you to see where Christ is in this, um, actually bears the sin of this psalm. He suffers in this same way. Think about all the parallels to the passion account and this psalm. So, for example, does Jesus have wounds that stink and fester? I would say probably so. After being flogged in the cat of nine tails where it's ripping flesh out and he's getting brutally beaten, I'm sure that didn't smell great. When he's crucified, surrounded by criminals, that probably didn't smell well, right? It's in the dirt, it's sweaty. I would say he fulfills that part of the psalm pretty well. Is he bowed down and prostrate? Yeah, he does get knocked off his feet several times. Are his sides filled with burning? Is there no soundness in his flesh? Is he feeble? Is he crushed? The answer is yes to all those things. Even more detail shows up. Look at verse 11. My friends and companions stand aloof. My nearest kin stand far off. His disciples abandon him because of his, how, how afflicted he is. His close family members, even you would say his brothers, they didn't want anything to do with him in the first place, right? So he has family that's away from him, his closest friends, his disciples are away from him. He's all alone, and only God can save him. That sounds awfully like the cross. There's many that try to lay traps for him, that's verse 12, who seek his hurt, they speak of ruin, they're meditating treachery. All you have to do is read the Gospels and see how the religious leaders of the time were trying to trap Jesus the entire time. And so he fulfills this on our behalf. In fact, there's a verse in 2 Corinthians 5 that I think really adds a lot of weight to the psalm. Paul says this, For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So Christ is sin in this moment, and he is crushed, bearing that, and actually experiences the full weight of that that we see here in this psalm. Um, but if you read the psalm with Christ at the center, it becomes clear that the suffering in the world that is really due to all of us causes emotional, physical, spiritual, and social pain and trauma that Christ himself is experiencing. And that's the ultimate solution of the psalm. Remember how it ends. Make haste to help me, O Lord of my salvation. We can confess this because Christ experienced the suffering of this psalm in the fullest extent possible so that we can have confidence God hears us when we confess and trust in him alone. When we repent like we do in this psalm, we know God hears us because of Christ. So when the psalm says, do not forsake me, O Lord, and do not be far to me, we can know that he is close, objectively close. In the waters of baptism and in Holy Communion, we can know that God is our salvation. It's not because of my merits or because I'm in a really good position right now and, oh, I just know he's there today. No, he's there whether or not I'm in a good mood or not. <laughs> he's always present because his promises are true. Pastor Dinger likes to say that to all the students. Where Christ's promises are present, those are his gifts. Where he is present, those are his gifts. He says things like that over and over so people know that they can trust and rely on those things even when you're having a bad day or even when you don't feel that close. We can have that assurance that comes from Christ. We can approach the throne of grace and know that we are at peace with God, which is something else that pastor likes to say. So in the middle of this red ladder challenge, it's really interesting to think about this, that as we confess our sins, it's not like we have to guess 
or we have to wonder, does God really hear me or not? Or does he know my condition? No, he does. Because in the person of Christ, in your baptism, in the faith that God's created in you, you can know that you are forgiven. So it's appropriate for us to be honest and to realize our broken condition, but it is also appropriate for us to be thankful for what Christ has already accomplished for us so we can have that boldness even in a season like Lent. Let's pray. Lord God in heaven, thank you for your word and its honesty. Thank you, Lord, that even when we're broken and when we are festering and we're smelly and laying on the side of the road, that you don't leave us there. And thank you also, Lord, that you send your son to take our place in that condition, that he becomes sin for us so that we might become righteous in your eyes. It's something, Lord, that's beyond what we can understand. It's not something that we can fully grasp in this world. Help us, Lord, though, for that little moments that we can get it, um, to cling to those promises so that when we are made aware of our sins, so that when we are at night and thinking about how we failed, that we can trust in those promises and know that we are forgiven and that sin, death, and the devil itself do not have the last word, but your son does, so that we can also look forward to an empty tomb in addition to looking to the cross. Thank you for this, Lord, and we ask these things in your son's name. Amen.